Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IANA webinar, Intermodal Analyze with Larry Gross, a Gross Transportation Consulting, our old friend and someone we rely on to help us out throughout the year. And I know a lot of you do as well, which is why we love to have Larry uh, join us for these super insightful sessions. It's been a heck of a year, so I just want to, uh, to let you know that we may go a little long today because we've got a heck of a lot to cover. Uh, I think everyone in the business can attest that it has been a wild ride. So there's a lot to look at. So Larry's going to take us through that. I think most people know Larry, but uh, let me just introduce him. He's been in working with us since I've been associated with IANA and, and, and long before that. But Larry is the president of uh, Gross Transportation Consulting and does a lot of work with us behind the scenes. It's always a pleasure to have Larry join us. Uh, and this is uh, definitely one of those occasions as we take a look back at 2020. It's in the rear views now, but its effects are lingering. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to my friend Larry to help us out and, uh, and start to understand what's happening. Well, thank you, Hal, and uh, thanks for that nice uh, intro. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Great to be with you. Thanks to Ayanna again uh, for giving me the opportunity here to chat with you, and I, I really enjoy having the chance to connect with the membership. As Hal mentioned, we, you know, we've got a fair amount of ground to cover. I'm going to try and walk through some slides in a little bit of a more leisurely fashion than sometimes we do, and of course, at the end, we'll take the questions. But with that, let me stop my video here so you get the full screen. Here's my contact info. If there are questions that don't get answered or, or any others that come up or you need to reach for me. So with that, let's get going here. So not exactly a tremendous insight, but the intermodal finished 2020 in an extraordinarily strong situation. We've had a true V-shaped recovery from the depths of the pandemic. And you can see that uh, in these two slides. Generally, the, the format is on the left-hand side here. You can see the monthly uh, revenue movements by sector. This data comes from the IANA ETSO database, which is equipment type, size, and ownership. And railroads report to IANA on a monthly basis uh, the number of revenue moves that they are taking by uh, various equipment types. So we can tell whether it's a container or a trailer. We can tell the length of the unit. And by knowing that, we can distinguish it between domestic and international, or what I'm calling international, you might also refer to it as IPI, inland point and a modal. That's the blue line on the left. That would be 20s, 40s, and 45 foot containers. The green line, is domestic equipment, which is going to be 48, so there are only very few of those left, basically 53-foot domestic containers and all forms of trailers. That's what composes the green line. Now, both the blue and the, and the green line work off of the right-hand axis in terms of the volume revenue moves per month. The red line is total intermodal. That works off the left-hand axis. So you can see that everything uh, that in terms of the uh, international, the IPI situation, the trough was in March. It bounced up a bit in April, then kind of marked time until June, in which, at which point the recovery really began in earnest. In the case of domestic, it hit the trough in, a month later in April, but then has risen consistently every month since then. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see what the year-over-year -year differences are by month and you're using the same color scheme. So blue is IPI, green is domestic, and red is total. And we have recorded some very, very impressive year-over-year -year gains beginning in, uh, uh, well, actually, it uh, looks like to me, I'm sorry, the uh, months are in error on this slide here. This is actually January through December, not October through September. So uh, forgive me that error, but uh, the last four months there, that are positive, that's going to be uh, September, October, November, December on the right-hand side of these charts. And the most, the largest uh, domestic gain uh, in the month of December, IPI only just now breaking into the black in, in December after having uh, languished below prior year throughout the previous uh, 12 months of 2020. Now, one of the things that we, that we need to be cautious about is when we look at year-over-year -year gains, we have to keep in mind what was happening last year at this time. And the fact is that the peak season 2019 was nothing to write home about. 
So some of this outsized gain that we're seeing here is actually a function of what happened last year as much as it is a function of what's happened this year. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit. So just to sort of table that, keep that in the back of your mind. Now, here are the uh, uh, numbers for December. You know, first, by sector and by equipment type, uh, the M over N is month to month. So this would be the change from November to December. And then year over year, of course, December of uh, 2019 to December 2020. And so we're seeing, we've seen, you know, very large year over year gains across the board. There are a couple of things I want to point out. One is that, as I mentioned, the international, there's got a big gain here, but that's really the first month where that's happened. Notice that the trailer year over year gain, 19.6%, is actually larger than that for domestic container. Uh, we're seeing some very strong trailer numbers. It kind of, it, in November, it took a little bit of a pause, but uh, really came on strong in December. You can see 53-foot trailer moves were up over 20% from November to December. Compare that to what's going on with uh, the domestic container, which had just very small increases from November to December. And that's an indication that basically we're capacity limited right now, or were in December, with regard to the domestic container fleet. The ability to grow was limited by the availability of equipment. And in fact, despite the huge demand, you can see that rail domestic container actually dropped a little bit, which we can talk about uh, in a little bit more detail. But so we only saw less than a percent improvement in uh, domestic container revenue moves from November to December. Although, as we pointed out earlier, the year over year numbers are, are very, very impressive. Let me go back up to short trailers. Short trailers is basically anything less than 48 foot or less. And these are the trailers more than any others that are being used for e-commerce parcel. Uh, we saw a big increase in 48. Uh, this is the seasonal surge fleet that typically doesn't come into use until uh, late in the peak season. But this year, those units were deployed as early as mid year as the e-commerce surge pandemic recovery surge began, uh, and actually it looks like that surge fleet has become larger than it was last year at this time, which accounts for this 11% improvement in year over year. Some of that was 28 footers, but actually more of it was 48. So that is another indicator of, of some of what's happening with regard to the e-commerce. If we look at the total down at the bottom here, 2.4% increase from November to December, about a 14% increase year over year. So a very, very impressive finish to the year. Now, one of the things that I really like to look at, because I think it gives us a clearer idea of what's going on in the marketplace, is revenue moves per average working day, which is what you see here on the right. And what this does is it, comp it, it uh, takes account of weekend effect and holidays to say what is the actual level of volume that's flowing through the system on any given workday. And this turns out to be a, a bit more complicated analysis than it would appear on the surface because, for instance, uh, it really makes a difference what day, for instance, Christmas lands on, what day of the week does it land on. There are different impacts uh, depending on which, which day of the week it is, a Monday or a Wednesday. Uh, and of course, there are significant differences in the number of working days per month. And so if you look at the, the compare the right hand chart with the left hand, we're looking at exactly the same data here, just treating it differently. And what you see is on the right hand side of this slide is the revenue moves per working day have been absolutely flat since September in terms of international and domestic. And there's only one reason in my experience when things are flat across that extended period of time. And that's because you're working against a uh, capacity limit. And of course, we know that uh, domestic was, was, with the exception of trailers, domestic was working against the capacity limit because the domestic container fleet was essentially fully utilized. And so the only way that you could have any flex up is either by getting more productivity out of the existing fleet, more moves per month, or having some more trailers flow in. And you certainly saw that uh, you saw a lot of 53 foot capacity flow in, but uh, that's still a relatively small piece of the puzzle. So not enough to really move the numbers in a dramatic way. 
The other interesting thing about this, though, is you see that we're also flat on IPI. And so what that tells me is that with the amount of volume that we have stacked up in the system, it's clear that demand is, has exceeded the ability of the system to perform. And not only was domestic capacity limited, but I think international was capacity limited as well. Now, I can't necessarily say which link in the chain has been the one that has been the biggest limitation. I mean, we've got, we've got so many out there that are under strain between the ports and chassis availability and box availability and, and well cars and locomotives and train crews, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see that from September, in terms of activity per working day, we really haven't seen much of an increase. So that is, I think, very, uh, very significant. Now, the other thing that you want to point out here is that uh, the peak season this year, very, very unusual, because there really has been no decline from the normal peak, which would typically happen for in a modal in October. So that's what has created these outsized year-over-year gains, even though volume is essentially flat in terms of activity per day, the year-over-year gains have expanded because typic in a typical year, in a normal year, volume would be declining at this point. So that's, I think, a very important point. And, and the question is whether or not this is sort of the new normal or just a one-off. So here is the AAR data, and this gives us a weekly, a weekly look. So now we're able to see what's happened uh, in the first half of uh, January. And uh, the, on the left-hand side, we see the North American weekly numbers as, as reported by the AAR. It's that heavy yellow line. And the dashed white line is the four-week moving average. The red bars are the year-over-year -year change, working off of the right-hand axis. So we've seen some very uh, significant year-over-year -year gains most recently. Uh, week, I think we're up to week two now. 2020 was one of those unique 53-week years when it, in the AAR universe. So now we're only in week two of uh, 2021. I do think if you look at the, uh, at the yellow line, we've rebounded from this, the deep trough, which always occurs on the holidays, Christmas, New Year, holiday uh, season. And now we've come back up out of that, but not quite to the level that we were prior to the holiday. So, it, it, you know, it, it's going to take another week or so to really tell the tale. Uh, we'll get more numbers tomorrow morning for week three. Uh, but I, my guess is we're starting to see what I would characterize as a little bit of a normal seasonal decline. Uh, although based on uh, my reading of the market, it's going to be uh, quite a, a, a measured decline from where we are now. The right hand side here, you see the same numbers, but just for US reporting railroads. So uh, in terms of the week to week, about the same 12.8% year over year on week two, last four weeks, about 13% uh, improvement uh, versus prior year. Now, here are the same numbers for Canada and Mexico. One thing I'll point out here, Canada on the left with the green line, is that they had a much more normal looking peak season than the, the US. You know, things peaked uh, late October, early November, and sort of declined from there. You still saw, you know, well, especially last week, you see this very outsized 21.2% gain. Uh, I will tell you that's a one-off because uh, there was some sort of an interruption, I don't recall what, last year at this time. And so last, uh, you know, 20, 2020, week two was very weak in terms of results. And so you get this outsized uh, year over year improvement, but I don't think it has much to do with what's happening right now. And I expect it to recede in the coming weeks. Uh, you know, I'll take a minute to talk about these, the differences between the, the U.S. market and the Canadian-Mexican market now. You know, uh, and, and there are, uh, I think, some pretty significant differences. Because if you look at the intra-Canadian market, roughly 73% of that market is IPI. In other words, 40-foot, 20-foot, 45-foot boxes. And only uh, about 27% is uh, domestic. If you compare that to the U.S., the U.S. IPI composes less than 42% of what's happening in the U.S. and 58% is domestic, or 59. So, you know, that's a pretty fundamental difference. And, and, and part of the story there is I think you see a lot more transloading in the U.S. from 40s to 53s 
than you do in Canada, where the four the forties move inland and then the railroads participate in helping get them back loaded to the coast. So that's a that's a pretty significant difference between those two markets. If we look at the Mexico market, the intra Mexico market, and you can see that there on the left, uh, that's even more IPI oriented. It's eighty three percent. So only seventeen percent domestic container is in its infancy in, in Mexico and, and the vast bulk of the volume in Mexico is the movement of ISO boxes. Now, if you look at these Mexico numbers, it's clear that they continue to struggle, Inamo continues to struggle with uh, very significant year over year deficits. A lot of that is operational issues coming from blockades, politically oriented blockades of the, of the railroads uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the railroads, they're just a convenient outlet to, uh, for people to put pressure on the government. Uh, but it has done its damage. And now, although the blockades have, uh, have uh, to my knowledge, been lifted, uh, we're still seeing a lot of, uh, uh, of sort of hangover from that and then significant uh, year over year uh, deficits. Just a couple of other color, I'll give you a little bit more color on a couple of other mid the major markets. You've got two other additional major markets in North America, the cross-border U.S.-Canadian market and the cross-border U.S.-Mexico market. Uh, U.S.-Canada is overwhelmingly uh, I, IPI, ISO, to the tune of about 80, uh, 92% of the volume crossing the, Mexi uh, the uh, Canadian-U.S. border is ISO boxes, only 8% of domestic containers, no trailers. In the case of the Mexico-US border, exactly the opposite. 99.7% of the equipment crossing the US-Mexico border are domestic containers. I mean, the number of ISO boxes is measured in, in handfuls. So that is a, a completely domestic market. So let's talk a little bit about what happened to the domestic container fleet. And we can divide the domestic container fleet into those that are owned by the railroads, about a third of the fleet, and the privates, which are folks like the temperature control guys, the big truckload carriers, and uh, that's about two thirds of the domestic container fleet. On the left, you can see the revenue movements per month for both red is rail owned, green is privates, and the year over year changes. So the things have been moving roughly in parallel. You can see that the red bars are showing larger year-to-year -year gains for rail-owned containers than privates. That's more, I think, a function of how weak the rail fleet performed last year at this time. So it gives them more upside in terms of year-over-year -year gains rather than any particular strength that we're seeing currently. And the way and, and the right hand chart uh, gives a little bit of, of background to that. And what I've gone done is go back to the moves per day measure that we talked about earlier. And what you can see that's interesting to me is that starting in, in October, October, November, December, the red line shows that rail owned revenue moves per working day actually have been declining while privates basically held steady. And again, the only reason in the face of such huge demand, why volume would decline is because of capacity limitations. And what this says to me is that the, the rail fleet was getting bogged down to a certain extent. And so its velocity uh, declined from uh, October to December. That's the, that's the implication of this number. Uh, I can't tell you exactly why it did so, uh, but that's pretty clear, clearly the message that I take away from this. We look at the import situation, again, just like North American in a model, very, very strong finish to the year and an abnormal peak season, at least with regard to imports, a lot of strength. Uh, unfortunately, not so with regard to exports. And on the left-hand side, you can see the imports are in blue. These are the TEUs arriving in North America, which in this case is defined as US plus Western Canada. Uh, Mexico and, uh, and Eastern Canada are not in this number as of now. I'm going to be working to try and incorporate some of those as I go forward here. But uh, you look at the yellow export TEUs and they're going exactly nowhere. The story is all about imports. Uh, and on the right hand side is the year over year change by month. Uh, blue is 
imports, yellow is, is exports. We only have exports through November. Uh, there, that reporting tends to lag a little bit, uh, so we won't have December for, for a while yet. Now, I want to point out how odd the peak season has been this year, because normally, in a normal peak season, T import TUs reach their maximum in August, and then they drop somewhat in uh, September and hold steady into October and drop again in, in November and drop again in December. And if you look at the, the typical normal, I'll put that term in quotes, normal peak see, uh, season seasonality, December is 10% lower on average than August in terms of TUs arriving. And this year, December is exactly the same as August. So there's been, and in fact, as you can see, the peak actually occurred in October. So a very sort of unusual shape to the peak season. And that's what, again, just like on the IPI and domestic, that's what's accounting for a lot of these outsized gains that we're seeing in the recent months is simply that volume is holding steady or, or actually increasing a little bit in the face of normal seasonality, which would call for a difference. So here you can see that expressed with the seasonally adjusted numbers. And when you have the same volume occurring in December that you do in, in August, in terms of unadjusted, when you put the seasonal adjustments in there, it shows you just how strong December was versus normal. And uh, seasonal, uh, on the seasonally adjusted North American inbound PEUs, that was a new record in December. So here's the, the detail by the major port regions. Uh, you see on the right-hand side, these outsized gains, which are pretty well across the board. The smallest gains being seen with Northern California and Western Canada. But you know, some of this I think is timing issues and, and such. I, I don't draw a tremendous amount of information uh, regarding uh, the, the difference, although I will point out, for instance, that uh, Western Canada had a smaller gain in, in December uh, versus prior year than did the PNW, which and those are arch competitors. PNW is digging itself out of a very, very deep hole. If you looked at the, at the story for the year or for 12 months, it would be a little bit of a different story and Western Canada will look stronger. The other thing I'll point out is you see month to month increases across the board, except for the Northeast. And that's significant because normally November to December is about a two to 3% decline. It differs by port. Each port or port region has a different seasonality. We track those individually, but in general, it would be, it's generally quite unusual to have an increase in any of these regions from November to December. Here on the right-hand side, we look at the, at the share of the epicenter of the current capacity crisis, which is LA Long Beach. And you saw some extremely, uh, uh, large increases in share towards the uh, middle of the year where uh, the, uh, the surge first landed in LA before it spread elsewhere. LA Long Beach's share has settled down, but not all the way to normal, uh, which is, I think, represented best by the 12 month moving averages that dashed yellow line. So we're still slightly above normal. We're still slightly above where we were a year ago which was about 33%. Uh, but the crisis, I mean, I think if you look at the bigger picture, the crisis that's occurring in terms of congestion in LA Long Beach is not so much because the volume is so much higher in December than it was a year ago, but just the relentless pace that has been in place for so long there, going all the way back, as you can see, to, to June. And, you know, if you look at, at Q theory, which is, you know, I use the example of a tow booth. If you're processing 500 cars an hour and 525 are arriving at the tow booth every hour, then the amount of time that you're waiting goes up every, every hour uh, significantly. And that's what's happened here, I think. We've been lagging behind, not, tr not tremendously, but it's been a compounding effect. And without any relief, they just can't dig themselves out from underneath. And that's why you're seeing this tremendous backup right now of, uh, of ships on the, on the ocean waiting to get in. The Dray situation is also showing some signs of strain. Uh, this is the drayage demand index that 
Uh, we put together with data from our good friend, uh, Jason Hilsenbeck of drayage.com. And we're measuring for these individual markets, the clicks that are received of folks looking for dray capacity. And uh, this map shows you pretty graphically, the red are the trouble areas. And then uh, if you get down to green and blue, it's indicating more normal conditions. Basically the entire East Coast, with the exception of Boston, is in the red zone, as is LA, Long Beach on the, on the West Coast. And the major interior points that are receiving IPI volume, Memphis, Kansas City, Chicago, and Columbus. Now, the, the, the situation that we have here, the red zone is actually kind of not sufficient because there are uh, four, uh, four markets where the, the, the index is over 300 which is sort of in the super critical condition. And those are listed there, LA, Norfolk, New York, and Savannah. That's where, you know, that's at the point where things are kind of going off the scale. You know, it's hard to say how much worse 200, 300 is than 200, but it indicates a market that's in what I would characterize as a state, not only of tightness, but of crisis. So the, the drainage market in these selected locations is under a great deal of strain. But if you look at other locations, the, the things are generally placid. So it's definitely a spotty situation. Train speeds, this is not a particularly revealing number. The intermodal train speeds, I'm well aware of the shortcomings of this measure as a service indicator, uh, but it can be a, a, a little bit of a candle in a dark room. And what, I, what it's telling me right now, at least in terms of the ability of the trains to get over the road is it's running about average. Uh, you, you can just see on the left-hand side, there's just a couple of weeks worth of 2021 data, uh, which is the red line. Uh, and we're considerably below where we were a year ago at this time, which is the purple line. These are average trains, intermodal train speeds across the intermodal North American intermodal network, as we, or the U.S. intermodal network as reported to the SDB. The blue line is the five-year moving average. So we're about we're about on average, but you know, in terms of recent performance, that's not particularly great. Uh, but uh, nor does it indicate a problem. Are certainly, like all of you, I think, hearing lots of anecdotes about terminal congestion and, and issues like that, which are not captured in this number. Uh, so at best, it's a very incomplete picture. Now I wanna take a few minutes here towards the end and then we'll open it up for questions to try and put what we're seeing right now in a longer context. And the question is, the question is really, how, what, is, what is the fourth quarter of 2020 telling us about the state of intermodal and these outsized gains that we're seeing versus the longer term picture. And, uh, and what we're looking at here is the last four years comparing 2020 to the last four years, quarter by quarter. Uh, so the purple bars on the left hand side is 2020 versus 2016. And then the blue bars are 2020 versus 2017. The red rust bars are 2018 and the green is 2019 or, or, or last year, prior year. And so you can see, you know, looking at the green bars first, we started off 2020, 2020 started off. These are total uh, intermodal moves. 2020 started off in the red, went deeper into the red in, uh, in the second quarter. Uh, came out in the third quarter with a fractional gain and then a very significant gain in Q4, almost 10%. Now, one thing I want to point out, you know, in terms of putting this fourth quarter into context, is that if you look at the red bar in the Q4, it's only 1.6% ahead of 2018. So this is the, what I was referring to earlier, that when we look at the year over year, we also have to be very cognizant of what was happening last year at this time. And last year in fourth quarter was very weak, intermodal performed weekly. Uh, so as strong as we think things are, were in the fourth quarter, in terms of total intermodal activity, less than 2% ahead of, of 2018 Q4. And it's interesting to me that that difference that's brought as many problems as it has to the intermodal network and it says something about 
our resiliency and the ability to respond to these very volatile changes that we've seen in 2020. Because if you look at the 1.6% change, the total capacity of the system should have been there to absorb most of this increase. But, uh, you know, perhaps it's pandemic effects, shortages of labor, but certainly, at least in terms of equipment, locomotives, cars, et cetera, uh, there should have been there, the capacity should have been there. On the right-hand side here, you can see what the years look like. Again, 3.8% ahead of, uh, of uh, 2016, slightly fractionally behind 2017, well behind 2018 in terms of overall year results. And even 2019, we were still 2% behind. Now, if we, if we translate that into compounded annual growth rate, and the one I want to concentrate on here is, uh, is on the right-hand side. We've only seen less than a uh, 1% compound annual growth rate in, in total intermodal activity since uh, 2016. Uh, so that's, uh, that's certainly less than GDP. And, you know, this is, this is a, I, I would say, a, a cause for some uh, thought with regard to the ability of intermodal to grow and, and intermodal being the growth engine for North American railroad and going forward here. Now, we've done the same analysis here for firstly IPI, which is what you're seeing here, uh, and then we'll show you domestic. And here are the, uh, here are the differences for IPI, and I'll call your attention to the uh, fourth quarter again, uh, where uh, 20, uh, 2020 IPI was actually slightly behind, you know, fractionally behind what it was in 2018. So as strong as Q4 feels to us, at least from an IPI perspective, it wasn't as strong as two years prior. If you look at the total for the year on the right-hand side, a 2.6% 2, 2 gain versus 2016, and, and we were lower for the year for 2017, 18, 19. And here are the compound annual growth rates. So IPI has grown 0.6% over the last four years on a compound annual growth rate basis. So hardly, uh, hardly a, uh, you know, a stunning growth story. The situation is, looks quite different when we, go, when we look at domestic. And, and uh, you could see the, the damage that was done early in the year, and then the, the dramatic recovery in Q3 and especially in Q4. But even here, if we look at Q4, the red bar, 3.7% uh, Q4, 2020 was only 3.7% ahead of 2018. So that is, you know, if you think about a two year time span, that's not a tremendous amount of growth. And so this is what, when I'm saying, I think that what happened in 2020 is perhaps a bit more of a reset to get us back to some kind of a normal growth pattern after a, a week 2019 than it is sort of the, this trem a tremendous boom, as one would describe if you look at a 10% year-over-year increase from 2019 to 2020. And if we look at the growth rates, even if we look at the fourth quarter, which is so the strongest quarter that we've seen in quite some time, the purple bar in Q4 shows us that since 2016, domestic intermodal has grown at a rate of 2.6% compound annual growth rate. So roughly, let's say, in line with GDP. And 2.2% from 2017, 1.8% from 2018. And the right-hand side shows you the, the totals for the year. So the growth here, if we set aside the, the last couple of quarters and just say that's uh, kind of an anomaly, it doesn't look to me like we are seeing sort of a new normal or repeal of the laws of intermodal in terms of, inter of domestic intermodal competitiveness. I think what we're seeing in the fourth quarter is sort of a unique confluence of, of influences, pandemic influences, weird seasonality, tight truck capacity, but not necessarily things that are going to extend indefinitely into the future. So with that, let's, uh, we'll start to tie it up here. In the near term, and by that I mean let's talk about the first half of, of 2021, things should, should really look very, very good. We've got a huge reservoir of freight uh, sitting on the water outside of the West Coast. We, we know there are 
or I guess over 30 ships now, based on what I'm hearing, just in the course in today, waiting to be unloaded just in LA, Long Beach, another ships uh, off of uh, the Port of Oakland. How many TUs that is, I, I don't really know. I, I had wanted to try and find out what the average discharge is for a ship in LA. I'm guessing it's somewhere, in, you know, we're looking at somewhere in the 175,000 to 200,000 TU range. That's a reservoir of freight waiting outside the harbor that, has, that has a significant percentage of which probably 60, 70% will end up on the rail in some form or fashion. Truck capacity is still pretty tight, although I think um, less so than we're seeing on the intermodal side. And I think we're going to start to see a little bit more normal seasonality. We'll see uh, truck capacity start to loosen as we go into the It'll continue into the first quarter. Of course, if we're going to focus on the year over year, we're going to see these astronomical year over year gains as we get into sec, you know, late first quarter, early second quarter, simply because we will have been la we will be lapping the, the teeth of the pandemic lockdown. So again, a, a very you know a cautionary note with regard to focusing entirely on year over year, it can be very misleading. And what we need to be looking at more closely is the sequential moves from month to month and trying to understand because that's really how we can tell what's happening right now versus what happened last year. Now, when we look a little bit further out and have, one has to make assumptions, uh, these are big assumptions and they could be very, very wrong. But here are my assumptions that uh, the vaccine program, we are all well aware of the issues that we're having right now. I think we are gonna get things on track uh, and, and uh, barring uh, uh, the unexpected, we should begin to see a return to normalcy. I should put that term in quotes, uh, beginning in Q3. And that there will be some form of federal assistance that will help bridge the gap between now and when we go back to quote, normal unquote. Undoubtedly, we're going to see GDP growth accelerate, but the comp composition of that GDP growth, I think, is going to be very significant because just as this recovery so far has been very freight friendly and intermodal friendly, then I think the this, this situation is going to flip because all of the, well, we're all bottled up in our houses and working from home on the kitchen table and we say, gee, I really need an office. I need this place is looking kind of run down. I want a new flat screen TV. And, and I'm not spending a lot of money going on vacation. I'm not spending a lot of money eating out. So I'm going to put that money into stuff to help make my nest, my home more comfortable where I'm spending all of my time. Well, that situation is going to flip when things go back to normal and everybody will be very eager to get out and do things outside of the house that involve spending money outside of the house. And most of those things are stuff that doesn't get moved in a truck or a container. So even though we see, we'll see, I think GDP growth will accelerate, the composition of it will become less intermodal friendly. And so as a result, we may not see the kind of growth. And of course, I don't really expect to see uh, sort of the, the shape of seasonality of the peak season that we did see this year, which I think was a one-off. And the other, uh, the other major assumption, I guess it goes without saying, but I should say it is uh, because we've had so many of these, no additional calamities beyond, ones, beyond the ones that we already know about. So here's my second half outlook. Uh, truck capacity is going to increase. We know it's going to increase. Uh, we can see it, it, first of all, because it always starts. Truck capacity always catches up with demand. Folks that say that the truck, you know, the driver shortage is going to continue to, to drive capacity, to drive volume to intermodal because there is insufficient truck capacity. That's only right in the short run and never right in the long run because the trucking industry, no matter how difficult it is, always figures out a way to get enough drivers to meet demand. And if you look at the uh, recent orders for tractors and trailers, uh, which are outside, it certainly indicates that the industry believes that it uh, will be able to find the drivers to put in the driver's seat of all these new trucks that they are, 
that they're acquiring. And we're already seeing clot rates uh, begin to decline, which are the sort of the most sensitive barometer of the canary in the coal mine with regard to uh, uh, truck capacity. Now, now, contract rates, in contrast, are going to rise because they always work with a six-month-plus uh, lag versus a spot. Uh, and so now we're going to be, contract rates are going to be playing catch-up with regard to the surge. And that is going to continue because trucking costs are going to go up, driver, driver wages are going to go up, and that's going to give Intermodal some top cover to, uh, from a rate perspective as well. We talked about the GDP growth. Consumer spending is 70% of GDP. And I think that's going to be the part that's at risk. We're going to see acceleration. We already are seeing acceleration in the manufacturing side, but it just doesn't have the leverage to fill, I think, all of the gap. Lastly, I'd say while the recent performance, I don't want to take anything away from Intermodal's recent performance, which has been nothing short of remarkable, but I don't think the basic ground rules have changed. And once all of this settles out and the, sm and the dust settles, smoke clears, we'll go back to some semblance of normalcy. It won't be exactly what it was before, but uh, it, will not, it will look more like that than it, than it will in the, uh, look like the fourth quarter. Import growth, I, I believe, is going to slow. I think in the long run, there's no reason to expect that in growth in import TUs is going to be any better than uh, GDP growth. The, good, the growth in the good sector of the GDP. And I think there's actually some pretty good rationale for why it would be slower. And then with regard to the domestic fleet, it's at capacity. Uh, we know it's at capacity in Q4. So the ability to go beyond that is gonna be strictly limited by how many containers are added, net containers are added after retirements to the fleet. Uh, and I suspect that that is uh, probably gonna to continue to be a limiting factor uh, going forward here because it uh, doesn't look to me like, at least based on what we're hearing right now, that we're going to see tremendous quantities of equipment added to the uh, domestic fleet. So uh, with that, Hal, I guess uh, I'll put in my shameless plug for the uh, Intermodal In-Depth report, uh, which contains much more detail uh, and, uh, and the detailed projections by equipment type going forward. That's, uh, that's one item I'll, uh, that uh, some of you may be interested in. Also, the IANA Intermodal Volume Analyzer, which provides a, uh, a detailed look lane by lane of what's going on by equipment type. You can get the Intermodal uh, In-Depth from me, and uh, the Intermodal Volume Analyzer can be uh, obtained from IANA, get both, and there's a 20% uh, discount on both. So with that, uh, Hal, uh, let me turn it back over to you. We can take some questions if there are any. That's great, Larry. Listen, thank you so much. Uh, that was a heck of a lot of work. Uh, and I, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I sort of feel like I just relived 2020 in about uh, 50 minutes. So <laughs> I've got a little bit of whiplash, but a great job distilling down all that information uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, man, where to start? There's a, a lot of, of, of good questions. Some of the high points, um, really interesting uh, digging into the IPI a little bit more and, and laying out the differences between uh, the three markets that make up the total North American market, I think was, was really interesting for folks. And that might be something that we dig in a little bit deeper in the future uh, episodes, because we, we think of North America frequently as a sort of a monolithic market. And, and clearly they're extremely different and the, the interactions are, are quite different for, for different reasons. You've also introduced some really interesting ways of looking at the data that I think uh, you know are worth really calling out. The moves per working day view, I think is really interesting insight that um, I think will add to a lot of people's intelligence because it, it, it takes out a lot of white noise and quite, has a pretty significant change on the numbers. So grab your crystal ball, Larry. Here's one that I think I know the answer to, but uh, it's, is there a way to quantify how much is actually being transloaded? Yeah, the answer, the answer Hal, is we do, we do track that in the uh, intermodal in depth on a quarterly basis. At least the transloading that's coming out of Southern California. There's also transloading happening in, in the PNW, and, and there will be more happening in Western Canada, uh, which, we don't, which we don't include. 
the assumption is that, that almost everything that comes out of Southern Cal in a container is transloaded. So if we look at the volume and we convert the TEUs coming in to 53s, we're able to get a, a picture of how much of what's coming into California is coming out IPI versus transload. And the general trend, which I think was was uh, implied by the question uh, correctly, is that the, the percentage of volume that's coming out of California on rail that's transloaded is increasing very slowly but steadily over time. So to put some to put some numbers to it, roughly about uh, 60, about two thirds of the volume that comes in to LA, LA Long Beach, actually more correctly into California, uh, comes out on rail in one form or another. About a third stays either truck direct to places like Phoenix or stays local, uh, never sees the rail. Now of that 66%, about 62% of that 66%, about, call it two thirds of the volume coming out on rail is transload and about one third is, is IPI. So that's kind of my, my swag. We look at that quarterly, we cover that in the, in the report. Uh, and generally speaking, there's, there's been a slow increase in the transload percentage, but at the same time, there's been a decrease in overall intermodal participation in volume. And there's also some seasonality to that. Transloading typically peaks as, a, as its percentage in the fourth quarter. And, that, and that's, I think, normally because of what I call the need for speed coming into the fourth quarter. Thanks, Larry. That, that makes a lot of sense. Here's a, here's a, a great question, and I, and I love where it's coming from. Once the intermodal supply chain gets straightened out, and I, I, I'm right there with them, hoping that that happens quickly, what will the new normal look like? On the intermodal side, do you expect to see LA Long Beach hold their share of gains or will they will it kind of go back to what we were seeing uh, in recent years where freight seemed to be moving, at least some of it moving to the East Coast? You know, and they're just a, sort of a, an, another component to it uh, would be domestic container uh, supply growth and will utilization remain a limit on, on growth overall? Well, so there are probably three questions in there. The first one is, is west to east migration. And I do, I do expect that to resume because what you've had, I think, during the recovery is a, is a need for speed. Folks are looking to get goods to replenish the, the supply chains as fast as possible. And normally, in normal circumstances coming from Asia, the fastest route to market is going to be through uh, Southern California, and then having the, uh, the additional benefit uh, of transloading is that it delays the decision of where the stuff's actually going to go for another three or four weeks until it actually gets landed here and transloaded, and then you can decide where the volume is going. So it may, enables you to be more responsive, which was a very critical situation when things were in such a state of chaos and you don't know where the freight is actually going to be needed. So buying that additional month of decision time is very, very valuable. Mm. But what we've seen is the downside of everybody trying to squeeze through the same keyhole. And so if everybody looks for faster delivery, then the result is nobody gets faster delivery. And I'm sure there's a lot of folks whose freight is sitting on the water on a ship waiting to be unloaded in LA that wished that they had rerouted it somewhere else. At this point. Now, all of that's going to get straightened out. So you could, then we're going to go back to what was originally driving the migration. And it was things like, where are the freights coming from? And although China has been extremely strong as a source here during the recovery from the pandemic, I am still of the belief that over the long run, the ship, the the sourcing will shift away from China to other locations, and many of those locations are more East Coast friendly. So, I, you know, I believe that we're going to continue to see or a resumption of that. I mean, we've already gone mostly back to normal, as I showed you with that, that market share slide. Not quite all the way, 
the most of the way. And I think over time we'll, we'll settle back and, and LA will have its, its sort of normal uh, normal share going forward. But it's going to take it quite some time to work its way through the current, uh, the current problems. The, the other was looking at, in terms of growth, the domestic container supply and utilization remain a limit. See, I don't see any real uh, reason why domestic container productivity is going to really improve because I, I don't see changes that, that are in the pipeline that would make that happen. I think there's, a, there's an open question with regard to the uh, future of the rail fleet versus the private fleet. Because we're seeing, I'll say, a performance gap in terms of productivity between the rail fleet and the private fleet. The private fleet tends to be a more productive fleet in terms of loads per box per month than the rail fleet. And I don't know what the, what the railroads that do provide equipment, what their plan is for adding equipment in 2021. With the fleet being maxed out, it's the only way to grow is that they have to add enough equipment not only to make up for the retirements and there will inevitably be retirements as, as units age out of the fleet but they got to do more than that so you know to me that'll be the biggest signal of what the railroad's intention is with regard to the to the uh, railroad fleet yeah th- there's a follow-up question from another attendee ar- around the, the domestic box capacity as well uh, and, and he's asking, are your comments there reflecting a belief that the container utilization just simply can't be improved significantly? I, no, I, I would say it could be improved significantly, but that would require approaching things differently. And I don't see any signs that things are going to be different. You know, so there's no reason to expect an improvement barring, I'll say, a change in the way we, we, we manage it. Right. So, you know, so I, there are there are certainly changes that could be made that that would make the, the terminals more fluid. And you know, I, you know, I, I would say that running fifteen thousand foot trains is probably not velocity friendly approach when it comes to the fluid. Fair enough. Um, and here's here's one that sort of riffs on it, but also pulls in. Uh, some questions around e-commerce and trailers. What are your thoughts on the Amazon effect and, um, as they continue to add assets? Well, one, one thing that's interesting about Amazon and, and uh, Walmart is that uh, they have had the heft, the scale, uh, to, to be able to work directly with the railroads in the U.S., which is something that the railroads have typically not done with, with the BCO. Well, so that's one change right there. In, with regard to equipment type, UPS has indicated that uh, uh, actually at, the, at a recent uh, Intermodal Expo, not the last one, but the last person one, as I recall, that they have uh, taken a close look at uh, the, the lanes that they operate that are, I'll say, container friendly. And they've converted, and this is something I'm sure they look at every, every quarter, they have converted the lanes that make sense from their perspective to containers. And the stuff that they, have, that they don't think makes sense stays in trail. To the extent that the railroads, as they have been doing, are dialing back on trailer lane availability, they're, they're, the railroads are going to pace the conversion. Uh, and some of that volume will convert, and some of it will go back to the highway. There's, a, there's volume that, that wants to be in a trailer, and if the railroad doesn't offer a trailer, it won't, it won't travel anymore. There's other volume that I think, given the proper incentives, converts over to, to, to the uh, container. Uh, the parcel business is, is a trailer. Is, is, there are good reasons why you, you, you uh, want a 28-foot trailer in parcel. Uh, it enables you to skip sorts. It's easier to load. There's a lot of good reasons, but a 28 footer is a bad in a motor trail because it takes just, it chews up lots of capacity, terminal capacity, car capacity. And so there are very good reasons to put it, to put in a motor with a 53 footer. And that's a balancing act that needs to be played by the folks that are, that are putting the, the networks together. Yeah, for sure. Um, and full disclosure, Walmart, Amazon. All the railroads are all members of IANA, so we're we're not we're not picking on anybody or, or picking favorites. We're just we're just talking about um, 
about the industry. W- one of the things that, that's come up with a couple of questions um, and certainly was definitely made clear in your numbers is uh, that outbound lag. And I know there are a lot of contributing factors. Any really stand out. We're still fighting a trade war, uh, for better or worse, with uh, many places, but China in particular. So, so there's obviously pressure there. Uh, but it seems like there's also pressure in terms of availability of boxes. Uh, a- any insights on, on what that, that might look like going forward? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think there are several contributing factors. Uh, one, one is simply the, the economy, despite the, despite the, 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 the what, what we're seeing in a model, the economy is still struggling. So in terms of, of, of outbound commodities, I agree with you, uh, agriculture is a big one, you know, brown paper, recycled brown paper, things of that sort. I mean, we're, we're unfortunately, we're not exporting, you know, a lot of high value goods right now. But it does, it, I mean, it is an indicator, I think, that the economy continues to struggle. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have disposable income are buying things, driving that import number up. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the economy is lagging behind that. And so I think you start to see some improvement in exports as, uh, as it, the uh, industrial sector uh, begins to improve. You mentioned the trade wars, that's certainly a factor. Uh, and you mentioned the difficulties that people are having on the export side securing equipment. And that's a real issue. And really, there are two pieces to that. One is that the ocean carriers are extremely reluctant to allow their boxes to go in them because the rates are so astronomical coming out of, out of Asia right now that it makes much more economic sense for them just to push that container back as empty as fast as possible than to have it run in when be repositioned for an export load that pays nickel for the dollar, chews up a lot of container time when that container could be you know, back in Asia getting another very, very uh, lucrative uh, eastbound load. The other thing, and I gotta go back to my crib shoot here, the other thing that that's very interesting is that when you look at the at the and this is now IANA numbers, so these are intermodal numbers, not input numbers. But what the IANA numbers let us do is, is differentiate between 20s and 40s, and there's a huge disconnect in what happened this year between 20s and 40s because 40 footers for the year 2020 were only down three and a half percent year over year. These are 40s moving on the rail. The 20s were down almost 15%. So a, a, a big, big disconnect there. And I suspect that the 20s, with regard to export loads, tend to be a little bit more friendly because a lot of those are heavy loaded commodities that like 20 foot equipment. So mm-hmm. that's another sort of, I'll say, difficulty that exporters are facing. Right. Well, listen, I think we should probably wrap up. Um, I appreciate everybody sticking with us. I know we went a little uh, longer than normal, but as I said at the outset, um, it was a heck of a year. I can't believe we got in an, a, an overview. with talked about that much in this little amount of time, frankly. Uh, but Larry, thank you so much for your work. Um, thanks to everybody for, for being here with us. If you want any other information, head on over to intermodal.org uh, about our, our programs. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be posting the uh, full intermodal um, uh, business of intermodal continues program for 2021 very soon. Um, be on the lookout for information about our meetings coming up this year. Uh, but with that, Larry, thank you very much for your hard work. Everybody, thanks for joining us. And with that, I will bid you all adieu until next time. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.